I've been arguing for a long time that obesity is essentially a state of mammalian torpor where we consume too many unsaturated fats and that slows down our metabolic rate. Of course, one of the questions I frequently get is how do we get out of torpor? Uh, this week, I saw this paper giving me the clearest example yet. Hibernating animals go through a whole yearly cycle. This SA over here and the SC and the SW, this is their active season. Uh, this is spring over here. This is summer active. And then they go into this torpor. And so this is their body temperature. And you can see the body temperature plunges during these uh, torpor bouts when they're actually hibernating. And this can go on for maybe 10 days or so. Uh, and then they have these brief spikes where their body temperature returns to normal and they have to do this every 10 days or so. Uh, and they actually dream when their body temperature is normal, which is interesting. Uh, torpor is not sleep. Torpor is a metabolic shutdown, right? And you have to be metabolically active to dream. And so this paper shows the succinate levels in the bloodstream of these animals over the torpor season. Of course, I sell disodium succinate on my website, fireinabottle.net slash shop. And I've been advertising this as a way to oxidize our NADH pool to increase our metabolic rate to help get us out of torpor. But it wasn't until I saw this paper that I realized that the hibernating animals already had the same idea that I did. And so ENT is entrance into torpor and ET is early torpor. So this is the time when the animals are shutting down their metabolism. And you can see they drop that succinate and early torpor almost down to nothing. And now this is kind of hard to see, but that arrow is on the left side of that spike in body temperature. So as they need to dramatically ramp up their metabolic rate and ramp up their body temperature, that is when they spike succinate. So they use the succinate to warm up their body temperature and actually get out of torpor. Additionally, they use these other two oxidants. I've talked about pyruvate in past videos, um, and alpha ketoglutarate is another one. So alpha ketoglutarate and pyruvate, both of the enzymes, pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, interestingly, both create reactive oxygen species. And so this is the citric acid cycle. And I've outlined, here's succinate dehydrogenase, here's pyruvate dehydrogenase, and this is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. You can see I've drawn in the ROS bit, but these are the three parts of the citric acid cycle where ROS is generated. And I've explained, you can watch my video, the ROS theory of obesity. Generating ROS is a way of injecting oxygen into the system and getting fat to burn cleanly because fat requires a lot of oxygen to burn. You need that ROS to burn the fat. And so hibernators store the oxidants during deep torpor. So what happens is succinate dehydrogenase is deactivated in the Krebs cycle. And so they can't burn the succinate while they're in that 10 day deep torpor stage. And so it builds up. And then when they need to wake up from torpor, they release all that succinate. And so the body tissues start burning that succinate and that gets their oxygen consumption up, that gets their metabolic rate up, and it ultimately gets their body temperature up. Are you really in torpor? And how did you get into torpor? So the oldest known mammal is Brazilodon quadrangularis, <laughs> a small shrew-like mammal, and that's important. That measured about 20 centimeters in length and had two sets of teeth, and this is according to the British National History Museum. Uh, the dental records date 225 million years ago. This is interesting because that mammal that lived 200 25 years ago, lived before the first flowering plants. A lot of people think of acorns as being the signal that winter is coming, but we know that this is not how things evolved because uh, there were no oak trees at the time of those first mammals. So what was probably the first dietary signal that winter was coming? You're in the north or you're far from the equator and you need to fatten up. Shrews, of course, eat mostly insects. Those first mammals were probably insect eaters since acorns didn't exist. So this is the fat composition of termites who live near the equator. They're about half monounsaturated fat and they have about 40% saturated fat and they have about 8% polyunsaturated fat. This is interesting because that ratio of saturated to monounsaturated to polyunsaturated is about four to five to one, which is fascinating because that is the same fat composition as humans. This is adipose tissue of humans from several parts of the world done in 1962. You can see I have the saturated fat outlined in red. Uh, yellow is monounsaturated fat. And this down here at the bottom is the polyunsaturated fat. 
uh, to get full saturated fat numbers, you have to add about 4%. And that's because they didn't list muristic acid, which is usually around 3% and these other minor fats that add a percent or so. So if you add up these numbers of the Nigerians, it's almost exactly four to five to one, just like in those termites. Furthermore, if you think, well, maybe humans are a bad example because we're all eating grain and, and you think that's not ancestral. If you go back and look at uh, chimpanzees, the ratio is four to five to one. So this seems to be a magical ratio, 40 parts saturated fat to 50 parts monounsaturated fat to 10 parts, 10 parts polyunsaturated fat, or perhaps a little less polyunsaturated fat than that. So I thought this study is interesting. This is a type of insect uh, found in Washington and California on the West coast of the U S you can see that you can see that these insects, right? So now we're very far from the equator. We're very far north. This is a temperate zone. You can see these insects are much higher in monounsaturated fat than those termites that were found at the equator. But what's very interesting about this study is that by winter time, the insects increase their monounsaturated fat up to 79%. And you can see stearic acid in these insects is at 1%. So you have incredibly low stearic acid, incredibly low saturated fat, very low polyunsaturated fat. When insects want to overwinter, they become mostly MUFA most of the time. Uh, so MUFA is the original signal to mammals that winter is coming, fatten up, because as mammals moved far from the equator to the north and they started eating these insects and as the insects built up their MUFA supplies as winter approached, that helped those mammals to fatten up and themselves uh, bulk up for winter. And so this is just another example of this. This is the echidna, the spiny anteater. The echidna is the most ancient mammal in the world. It lays eggs and it lactates, but it doesn't have nipples. The milk just exudes from its skin. Uh, this is a truly, this is a truly ancient mammal. And so you can see this is in 1999. Uh, the echidnas are eating these ants. So these are ant larvae. And this is in the southern hemisphere, very far south of the equator. And so these ants are very high in MUFA. You can see it's 65% MUFA in these ants. And so the echidnas before hibernation are up to 69% monounsaturated fat. That is, that's their torpid metabolism that they're about to hibernate on. And you can see when they emerge from hibernation, the monounsaturated fat is down to 55%. And if you look at that ratio, they're not quite at four to five to one, but they're approaching the magical ratio of four to five to one. If you swapped out 5% of MUFA with saturated fat, they would be there. So this is now in 1985 in Toronto. Remember those humans that I showed in different parts of the world that were four to five to one? These guys are all the way down to two to four to one. Look, saturated fat is all the way now down from 40% to 26% and monounsaturated fat has gone from 50% up to almost 58%. So they're not quite as monounsaturated as a hibernating echidna. So if we consider the monounsaturated to saturated fat ratio, we can say that in Nigeria in 1962, it was 1.23. In Colombia in 1962, it was 1.3. And in Canada in 1985, that study I just showed was from Toronto. The number is 2.2. So in the modern era, as we have eaten more and more unsaturated fats, what's happened is both from our diet and from enzymes like SCD1, we have massively increased the amount of monounsaturated fat and we've replaced saturated fat with monounsaturated fat in our bodies. That's what happened to all of us, not even those of us who are obese. That's what happened to everybody. And so that puts us in a position where it is easy to then fatten up because we have the metabolism of a torpid animal. So monounsaturated fat activates a nuclear receptor called PPAR alpha and PPAR alpha is a transcription factor, which means that it goes into the nucleus when it's activated and it turns on a whole bunch of genes, a, Cybe a Syrian hamster. This is another animal. This is a Syrian hamster. That's also a hibernator. And you can see in the active C Season. Here, here's PPAR alpha at the top. Blue means the animal is not producing a lot of PPAR alpha during the active season in summer. But as the animal approaches hibernation and then gets into hibernation, 
the amount of PPAR alpha is dramatically increased. PPAR alpha is involved in the process of increasing lipogenic enzymes by activating delta 6 desaturase and delta 5 desaturase. And what those things do, and you can see my past videos about olive oil, they help to oxidize polyunsaturated fats and turn it into things like 15 heat and anandamide that are crucial in the fattening process. And PPAR alpha also increases all of these other genes involved in fat metabolism. And this makes sense. If you were that hibernating bear, we can say this is PPAR season. So that whole time uh, from late August when they become hyperphagic all the way through hibernation, we can say that PPAR signaling is in control of that bear's metabolism. That's another way to think about torpor is a metabolism that is being run by PPAR alpha. And of course, hibernators are going to exist on their own body fat all winter. So that's fine. That's what you want is to have those enzymes involved in fat metabolism upregulated, and that will make you insulin resistant. Another fun part of the story is that human body temperatures have decreased since the industrial revolution. There's a lot going on in this table. You can see on the bottom as you go from left to right, that's increasing age. Um, the left column is white people, the right column is black people, and then on the top are men, and the bottom is women. Unfortunately, we don't have women data from 1900-ish because I think these were uh, people who were going to war whose body temperatures were being taken. So we only have male data back there. But this is 1900, and you can see that male body temperatures up to the age of 50 or so very tightly match the sort of canonical 98.6 degrees or 37 Celsius. By 1970, uh, that number drops a bit, but today uh, that number is significantly lower. And so that's about uh, 0.3 degrees Celsius lower. Uh, so I think that's about a degree in Fahrenheit. And so normal body temperature in the year 1900 was 98.6. Now it's probably 97.5 or 97.7, something around in that range. And this is interesting because, again, when you look at the seasons of the bear, you see in hibernation season, of course, their body temperature is very low. Their metabolism is shut down. But then between May and October, right, in October, PPAR alpha is in charge, right? They're now in full-on PPAR season. They're hyperphagic. And that change in temperature between May and September is about 0 0.4 degrees, which is kind of eerily similar to the amount that human body temperatures have dropped over the past 100 or so years. Furthermore, so this is a study done in mice. So these mice were given bezafibrate, which is something that activates PPAR alpha. And if you, and this is just put into their food. And so if you activate PPAR alpha in mice, and this is the gray lines, the mice will spontaneously go into torpor. You can see this big body temperature drop. That's torpor. And that happened within about two weeks of activating PPAR alpha. But what you can see is this black line is mice without PPAR alpha. So I kind of drew in. So these lower parts, uh, this is the daytime when the mice are asleep. And these higher bits are nighttime when the mice are active. And so you can see during the active phase, this black line, I mean, I'd fudge this line, obviously, but it's somewhere around here. And this is my guess as to the average of the mice body temperature during the active part of the day. And so I would say that the PPAR alpha drops the body temperature of mice by about one degree Celsius before they go into torpor. And that drop... Uh, is going to be more dramatic in mice because they have a higher surface area to volume ratio. So body temperature is much more volatile in mice than it is in bears or humans. And so when you eat oleic acid, you produce something called oleoil ethanolamide. And you can see that that activates the nuclear receptor PPAR alpha. So this is dietary MUFA does the same thing in humans, maybe not quite to the same degree as giving that drug bezafibrate does to mice and helping to lower their body temperature. When we do lipolysis, so white adip adipose tissue, that just means fat tissue. So when you don't eat for a while after a meal, your body starts releasing fat out of your stored fat tissues, but that also activates PPAR activity. The fats that activate PPAR alpha the most are the monounsaturated fats. So here's uh, 
16 carbon monounsaturated fat, and this is oleic acid. The 18 carbon uh, saturated fat that is in olive oil, and it's probably the majority of your stored fat. You can see those monounsaturated fats dramatically activate uh, PPA or alpha, and the long chain saturated fats do not. And so the more that your body increases monounsaturated fat, the more active your PPAR alpha signaling is going to be the exact same signaling that lowers the body temperature of mice. This is yet another study in hibernators. This is a real complicated uh, chart. I'm sorry. Each of these vertical uh, lines of little colored dots is a single animal. And so um, this is like six different hibernating animals uh, during their active season. And this is like five um, these are those two different parts of spring where they're active. This is summer active, and this is the different stages of torpor as they're phasing in and out of torpor. And so what do we see? These are all different metabolites. And so let's look at vitamin B6. So vitamin B6 is very high in the active season, but then during torpor, it's very low. And in my video, uh, Meat and Potatoes, we talked about vitamin B6 is low in human obesity. Okay, now let's look at kinurinine. Kinurinine is low during the active season, but it is hugely increased during torpor, right? Um, and we saw in meat and potatoes that kinurinine is increased in humans who are obese. Furthermore, if you supplement mice who are obese and have high kinurinine levels with vitamin B6, those kinurinine levels will go down. And so we can say that a shared feature of torpor and obesity is low vitamin B6 and high kinurinine. And the high kinurinine activates the era hydrocarbon receptor. Another thing that is the same between torpor and obesity is high homocysteine levels. So you can see uh, this green, that's homocysteine. And you can see that in torpor, homocysteine levels are elevated compared to the active seasons, which are quite blue. High homocysteine is caused by a lack of methyl groups, um, a, a lack of ability to methylate. Here's another interesting thing. So we have these drugs called fibrates and we give them to humans actually to lower their lipids. So to lower their quote unquote cholesterol levels. So what they do, fibrates activate, guess what? PPAR alpha. That's what they do. And now look at this. Fibrates cause hyperhomocysteine anemia <laughs> or however one says that word so the activation of ppar alpha in humans increases homocysteine levels and an animal who is torpid and is under control of ppar alpha has high homocysteine oh isn't that interesting this is again from my video turnip greens and buttermilk here's the arrow hydrocarbon receptor when the arrow hydrocarbon receptor is activated it actually wastes methyl groups over here and this is homocysteine and homocysteine need, needs methylated folate to be converted to uh, methionine. And so what happens is if there are not enough methyl groups around, you can't make methylfolate and the homocysteine builds up. And so another thing that the animals do when they want to get out of torpor, so this is that early arousal again, this is when they're surging their metabolic rate. They increase this thing called uh, SAM-E, which is the master methyl donor of the body. So in addition to surging those oxidants, uh, the hibernating animals are also surging methyl groups to get out of torpor. One thing you can use to increase your methyl groups, if you need, if you're thinking about supplementing, is something called betaine. Uh, there are some good studies that show that betaine can help with this problem of high homocysteine, uh, and it does lead to some weight loss, and it can help with fatty liver disease. Other options for supplementing methyl groups are choline and methylfolate. I think all of these things potentially have a role. Also, SAM-E, as you saw, as a popular supplement. Okay, here's another one, nicotinamide. So I showed this in my video, PARP, NAD+, and metabolic rate. PARP is this enzyme that's activated by the AROT hydrocarbon receptor. And what happens is it decreases this enzyme called NAMPT, and it decreases CERT1, the deacetylase. We need NAD+, to run our metabolism. And PARP converts NAD plus to nicotinamide. So this NAM, that's nicotinamide. And that enzyme, NAMPT, uh, this is the thing that's reduced by the aryl hydrocarbon receptor so that you can't recycle the NAD plus. 
the NAD plus, as I said, is needed by deacetylases and the deacetylases activate your mitochondrial enzymes. And so if your enzymes are acetylated, you can't run your metabolism. So you need cert one deacetylase activity to activate your metabolism, but the aerohydrocarbon receptor is activating PARP and converting it all to nicotinamide. It's also uh, blocking NAMP, so it's blocking this step, and that's why nicotinamide is going up. But guess what? Um, nicotinamide actually inhibits the enzyme activity of cert one So you have this feedback loop of AHR building up nicotinamide, blocking cert one and also there's not enough NAD plus around anyway. We can say another parallel between torpor and obesity is low cert one activity and high enzyme acetylation. Moving on, 4-HNE, well, that's oxidative stress, don't you know? And we can see that 4-HNE is involved in the progression of obesity in mice. It helps keep them obese. It's absolutely a type of oxidative stress. So maybe what we need are some antioxidants. No, <laughs> the problem is that we're in torpor. You know, we can't just keep playing whack-a-mole, right, with all of these different things. It's like, okay, yeah, you got to do B6 and and methyl groups and antioxidants and blah, 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 right? Um, that's a whack-a-mole game. You can't win because you're failing to fix the underlying problem, which is high levels of oleic acid and PPAR signaling, right? Uh, you need to get out of torpor. That's what's going to solve the problem, right? You're not low in vitamin B6 because you're not consuming enough B6. It's because you're in torpor and some metabolic pathway is, is stealing the B6 somehow. And so the question is, what do the animals do when they emerge from torpor? So the part of the spring when the animals wake up and they're moving back into active mode is called emergence from torpor. What they actually do in that early, that early exit from that torpid metabolism is they surge these oxidants, pyruvate, succinate, alpha ketoglutarate. I have succinate for sale at fireinabottle.net slash shop. You can buy calcium pyruvate at bulksupplements.com. If you use my discount code FIRE, uh, F-I-R-E, you will get a discount on that bulk pyruvate. That's the cheapest place to get it. What I do is I take half a teaspoon of that and I put it into tea with a little bit of sweetener and I brew a bag of poor tea in there and drink it like a little sweet tart poor tea in the morning. So diet. If you've watched my other videos, you know this is one of my favorite charts. Uh, this is what grizzly bears ate in Yellowstone Park in 1977. I can't really think of a better example of the sort of seasonal eating than grizzly bears. Obviously, people like grizzly bears, but they've also been heavily studied, especially in Yellowstone, because it's a it's a national park and you can do a lot of research there. The grizzly bears in the spring eat a lot of elk because a lot of the elk don't survive the winter. And so there's literally frozen elk carcasses. And in April, there's not a lot of plant growing plants growing yet. And so the grizzly bears start by eating a lot of elk. As the season goes on, their leafy plant consumption explodes. And so G means uh, graminoids. That really means grass. F is forbs. That's things like dandelions, leafy plants. And then they actually dig. Uh, the bear claws are actually great digging tools. And so bears dig and eat tubers. And so you can see by June, as they're sort of fully becoming fully active, uh, they're actually eating a huge amount of these plant foods between grass uh, Forbes and tubers. Here's a, a little better example of their diet. The type of meats they eat are elk and bison. And so I just pulled up, this is out of the USDA database, but you can see elk and bison are actually both pretty low fat meats. Um, but the fat that they do have is very high in saturated fats compared to the amount of monounsaturated fats, particularly elk is way more saturated than unsaturated. Uh, bison are similar, but bison, interestingly, have a huge amount of stearic acid. According to the USDA database, bison fat is 25% stearic acid. That's in grass-fed ground bison. So they're also eating tubers. And like I say, this biscuit root is a very common thing that they eat. Biscuit root is basically a potato. It is a high quality starch containing tuber. They also eat this thing called yampa, which is just a wild carrot that grows in the West. Graminoids, you can see that is the number one part of the grizzly bear diet. That's just grass. Here's grizzly bear eating grass. Uh, if you've ever been to if you've ever been to Yellowstone in the spring, you can actually see the bears grazing. It's kind of fun. 
And so one of the things the bears get out of that diet of plants is they get polyphenols. And so this is an example of a study there are polyphenols called apigenin and luteolin. These are found in grasses and all green plants to some extent. And you can see this is a uh, era hydrocarbon receptor activity and the luteolin and the apigenin in particular seriously suppress era hydrocarbon receptor activity. Bears also like these forbs, including clover, thistle, horsetail, dandelion, onion grass, um, I wanted to focus on dandelion for a second. Dandelion has some very interesting properties that actually increases cholesterol excretion. And so I have a video called bile acid flow where I talk about um, cholesterol excretion and bile acid excretion. I sell on my website these Tia Brownin capsules, which is an extract of poo or tea. And you can see that Tia Brownin increases uh, cholesterol excretion by a massive 20 fold in rats, but it also increases bile acid excretion by five fold. And so this can be really useful to help you get out of reductive stress, the ability to release some of the extra cholesterol and bile. And this is another thing. Dandelions are very bitter. We have these bitter taste receptors, not just in our mouth, but also in our gut. And when those bitter taste receptors are activated, you release something called GLP-1. You might have heard these news stories recently about people trying to lose weight. So they're signing up for these weight loss drugs like Ozempic and uh, diabetics who really need the Ozempic can't get it. Well, Ozempic is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So Ozempic is mimicking the action of GLP-1 and it definitely causes weight loss. And you can release more GLP-1 by eating bitter things like dandelion greens. Also, the grizzly bear diet is very high in folate and B12, right? Because they're getting elk and they're getting grass and they're getting forbs. And I showed in the video turnip greens and buttermilk that both B12 and folate also decrease aryl hydrocarbon receptor activity. So think about it, folate, all of these polyphenols, these are seasonal signals that it's now the active season and it's, it's no longer winter, right? We need to get active. We need to get insulin signaling going again. We're consuming carbohydrate foods. We're trying to get out of that PPAR alpha mode that most of us have probably lived in our entire adult lives. So I'd say this last part of the season is actually insulin season. And so in the active season, the bears are basically eating greens, carrots, and potatoes. PPAR alpha activity and AHR activity is going to be low. Mice lacking an era hydrocarbon receptor have increased insulin sensitivity, and this is dependent on the PPAR alpha pathway in mice. Furthermore, mice without a PPAR gene are also protected from high fat diet induced insulin resistance. What happens in fall when the bears want to get torpid again? Well, this is a different year. This is 1978. This is a more typical year because pine nuts are available. And you can see that early in the season, the bears start to increase consumption of ants and then fruit and then pine nuts. And so by the time you get to September, this diet is really high in unsaturated fats and fructose from that fruit, right? And that is how those bears are going to get torpid again. Um, you can also see that polyphenol levels are dropping, right? They eat way, way, way less of those plants. Uh, you can see folate levels are dropping. Uh, you can see in most of the summer, July through September, they're not getting a ton of B12. And so we can basically divide this into two categories. Emergence means getting out of torpor. Emergence means getting into torpor in the language of biology. And so, of course, at emergence, we want a surge of oxidant succinate, alpha-ketoglutarate, pyruvate. We might consider a lower fat diet, but when we consume fats, we want to focus on saturated fat and stearic acid specifically. We also want to think about making sure we get sufficient folate, vitamin B12, polyphenols, bitters. You know, think about adding dandelion greens, turnip greens, collard greens, campari. Anything bitter is going to help activate those bitter taste receptors. Uh, lastly, methyl donors, right? So choline, betaine, beets are a good source of betaine. And what you want to avoid is things that cause emergence. And so that's monounsaturated fats, that's polyunsaturated fats, that's fructose, but it's also the lack of methyl donors, the lack of oxidants, the lack of saturated fat, the lack of folate and B12, the lack of polyphenols, the lack of bitter foods. Obviously what I've laid out here is a very sort of loose working framework 
of what a diet and a plan to get you out of torpor might look like. Come back for more videos. I'm going to keep trying to fill in the blanks. Uh, I love getting your guys' comments in the threads of the videos. It gives me ideas. And hopefully as a community, we can keep working and thinking on these things and thinking about ways to get insulin signaling back going again and get out of this torpid metabolism. I'm Brad Marshall, author of the blog fireinabottle.net. You can join the discussion on Reddit at r slash saturated fat. Follow me on Twitter at fire underscore bottle or on Instagram fire underscore in a bottle. Thanks for watching.